Compelling evidence of the mega tsunami that was generated by the Burkel Crater impact event exists along every major coastline in the Indian Ocean. From Australia to India to the Middle East, Africa and Antarctica, the 200 odd metre high mega tsunami struck every major coastline, altering them in an instant as they scoured their way inland before dropping massive amounts of sediment, retreating and leaving massive depositional hills behind. These hills, known as chevrons, are a typical byproduct of a mega tsunami event. Their existence is owed to the fact that when this comet struck the bottom of the deep Indian Ocean, a massive amount of sediment was thrown up along with the tsunami that was generated. This unimaginable amount of sediment that was strewn with deep sea microfossils was imbued with alien metals as the asteroid's contents fused with the fossils during impact before being carried away by the massive tidal waves that were generated. This episode is the summary to the series on the mega tsunami that impacted the world 5,000 years ago. I know right, long time coming. Sorry about the delay here guys, I got a bit burnt out on this and I knew that if I forced myself to produce this video earlier, I'd be compromising the quality of it. So I needed a small break away from obsessing over chevrons. But I'm back to conclude this series and to give you guys everything you've been waiting for and more. To briefly touch over what we've already covered in this massive series, at first we began in Australia and we painstakingly documented the many directional chevrons that existed in the areas that were exposed to the Burkle Crater Mega Tsunami based on the location of its epicenter in the Indian Ocean. We then covered Antarctica and some evidence that exists there. In this episode, we'll be beginning in Indonesia where obvious chevrons exist before heading westward into Sri Lanka and India after which we'll go to Pakistan and then cover Yemen, Oman, Somalia, Madagascar and end at South Africa. Because of the massive distance that we are covering, only the most prominent evidence will be covered. So without further ado, this is the conclusion to the Burkel Crater Mega Tsunami series. Part 1 Indonesia Indonesia is a dynamic, ever-changing land located in one of the most tectonically active regions on the planet. The volcanism here is one of the most extreme as well. And that poses a dilemma that is somewhat unique to Indonesia, at least in this series. The lack of mega tsunami evidence in Indonesia has led to many doubting the Burkle Crater impact theory. But along with the volcanism, another problem is the tropical climate that exists here, which means vegetation will be hiding much of the evidence. And that's why this simulator has been by far the most incredible tool to reveal these little guys because of the accurate topographical data that it has. You wouldn't be able to spot the chevrons I'm about to show you on Google Earth or Google Maps. And the snow function just serves to further highlight the typical V-shape seen in mega tsunami chevron deposition events. When the 180 odd metre high mega tsunami finally reached Indonesia, it would have inundated and scoured these tiny, relatively flat islands as it was passing through, leaving little to no deposition behind. But when it finally reached the main group of islands, well, that was a different story. There's a rise in elevation to around 150 meters high. When the 180 meter high mega tsunami smashed into this place, this sharp elevation would have taken much of the force. Meaning when the mega tsunami leaped over it, the drop in power led to a massive drop in sediment being held by the mega tsunami. And do you see it? They begin to be deposited after the waves smashed into the shorelines before dropping most of the material over here, with the direction that corresponds to the epicenter of the impact event. But did the waves stop here or keep going? Let's see. And as you can probably tell, we've got an issue here that we're going to run into time and time again, especially when we head to India, which has much of the land reshaped for farming. The chevrons, they're gone. The ground's been leveled, but they're not fully gone. I can see very, very faint outlines. So this is it, you probably think. Nope, look at this. Bam, this was big. Some erosion has occurred to the largest of these with rivers passing through them. And after the main deposits, we have smaller ones that slowly taper off. Once upon a time, this entire coastline would have had chevrons dotted all throughout it before being leveled. Now, as previously mentioned, the issue with Indonesia is deciphering what is tsunami related from what is volcanic. The directional nature of these and their shape 
tells me that whilst there's an interplay between the two, the vast majority of what you see here is Mega Tsunami related. But yeah, the lushness of Indonesia is the obstacle that has led to many speculating that chevrons don't exist here. But they definitely do. And this is just one spot, the entire shoreline of Indonesia has this occurrence. But unlike the Australia series, I can't cover every spot or else this will turn into a 5 hour documentary. So let's move on. Part 2. India and Sri Lanka Beginning in Sri Lanka, the land here is quite low in elevation, with much of it being under 15 metres in height. In theory, this means the mega tsunami would have cruised over here, depositing smaller chevrons, before finally colliding with this ancient mountain range from a continental abduction event, before losing power and dropping the bulk of the sediment. Now let's see if what I just said lines up. And yep, it appears to. Smaller chevrons over here, peaking around here, right at the point where the ancient mountain range begins. Which is, by the way, taller than the mega tsunami by about 50 metres. And the largest chevrons occur en masse here. On the eastern side of Sri Lanka, where the ancient mountain range doesn't extend to, we see chevrons that made it much further inland. And they are quite numerous and large in size too. We're in India now, and you can probably see the issue right off the bat. Much of the land has been reshaped for farming or for homes. Very little evidence of what was once here remains. Much of it is located on the western side of the southern tip, as the eastern side has almost been completely flattened out by humans. But in general, it received very little impact compared to the western side of India, and probably only had smaller chevrons. But over here, in between the human development, we see some large chevrons popping out. Now, unlike Indonesia, we do not have volcanism interfering with our ability to interpret the land. These are very clear chevrons, with a very pronounced V-shape and a direction that correlates to the impact event's epicenter. As you can see, they got stopped short in their ability to go very far inland by these very pronounced mountains. And thus, the wave was forced to head north and to skim along with the direction of the mountain range. These cities that exist here have literally been built on top of the evidence of the mega tsunami, much like Perth in Australia had been. And if we were to follow India north, we would see this evidence all along the shoreline. Part 3. Pakistan Pakistan really got smashed guys, I can't stress this enough. The damage here was so pronounced that it took me a while to actually accept what I was looking at. I mean, look at this. This mountain range is more or less the endpoint of the chevrons, and as we journey back towards the sea, we will see something truly astonishing. This place is so arid, I don't need a snow layer. Yes, these are chevrons. Every one of them. They aren't erosion related, they aren't carved out drainage channels. These are chevrons, and as you can see, they end right here. Isn't this absolutely mind blowing? As you can see, parts of it have larger sediment deposits than others, and this has to do with hydrodynamics, i.e. how sediment acts when it is suspended in water regarding when it drops out, kind of like how a river acts during a flood, and how the specific gravity of different sediments accumulate in different areas of the river. Along with this, part of it has to do with post-deposition erosion. Man, they are freaking everywhere. They're such a profound size, and as you can probably tell, they look very similar to the shapes that we saw in the most arid parts of Western Australia, and they are all directional. If this doesn't prove the fact that we had a mega tsunami occur in the very recent past, I don't know what will. As we journey inland a bit more, these shapes fade altogether, showing they aren't Aeolian in nature. Look how pronounced the deposition was where it landed here. Truly insane stuff. But what makes this even more insane is when we look at Pakistan from a bigger perspective. And doesn't this look familiar? This looks very much like what we saw in the Australian series, when we went over South Australia and Western Australia. What we are seeing here is the extent of the mega tsunami, before it finally lost power and receded. It's carved out the land. It's very obvious and amazing to see. These chevron shapes go further along Pakistan, but we're going to move on to the next incredible sight. Part 4. Oman. Yemen and Somalia. We are currently in a location that is quite close to the border between Yemen and Oman. At the moment, we are in Oman, looking at an incredible site of deposition. 
The mega tsunami rode up and ascended this sloping incline before leaping over the top of this mountain range and depositing the bulk of the sediment that it was carrying, like one would expect, due to the fact that the wave lost much of the power that was driving it when it slammed into this mountain. Massive chevron shapes exist, before just fading into oblivion. As we continue along this range, we see more V-shapes appearing all along it, with the most pronounced parts of it being right where the wave lost the bulk majority of the force driving it. Although, to be fair, this city levelled much of the evidence that was once here. As we cross over into Yemen, we're met with much of the same thing, vast chevron shapes that suddenly taper out at a certain distance. At Somalia, the chevron shapes are a bit more distinct. It bore the brunt of a direct hit to a much higher degree as a result of its relatively flat topography. There was no mountain range to absorb and buffer the impact here, like we had in Yemen and Oman, so we have long chevron shapes that stretch very, very far inland. And yes, this is one big sediment slide. It's unbelievably long, and as you can see, this slide is actually comprised of many, many thousands of chevrons. And the reason this occurred is because sediment slowly dropped out, instead of being forced out all at once, like we see when the mega tsunami waves impact obstructions that are strong enough to take the incredible force that they exert when they slam into it. And thus it slides. This area must have been a pronounced topographical low before it was choked up by these chevrons. It almost looks like a shark fin, and it joins up with the rest of the chevron damage right here. But this is the furthest slide inland to exist in Somalia, with it reaching a little over 140 kilometers inland. Absolutely mind-blowing. But when viewed from above, it's even more remarkable. From the slide to the accompanying chevron depositions, in my mind, there isn't a shadow of a doubt that this event occurred. But now, we're approaching Madagascar, the site of the largest identified chevron deposition known from this event. Part 5. Madagascar and South Africa. If there's one place I wouldn't want to have been when this impact event occurred, it was Madagascar. And the reasoning for this is, well, this. This is truly a site where the land was drastically changed overnight more than anywhere else that we've covered. Now, chevrons exist all along the southern and eastern coastlines of Madagascar. But let's get straight to the good stuff. The most famous group of chevrons is known as the Fenambosi chevron. It's 180 meters high. The same tears that we saw all across Australia occurs alongside it. And these chevrons are very similar to the ones that we just saw in Pakistan. I mean, check out this massive chevron slide. It's exactly the same as the ones that we saw in Western Australia, which is truly remarkable for the fact that the wave had barely lost any of its power by the time it hit Australia. These chevrons contain an abundance of carbonate marine microfossils that have been deposited along strike distances of between 12 to roughly 40 kilometers. These microfossils differ from those that dominate local beach deposits, as they are of a deep sea origin, and are also fused with alien metals from the meteorite. Many tests have been done, and scientists have more or less reached a conclusion that these chevrons are of mega tsunami origin. And now we're approaching our final destination, South Africa. This area is a bit more lush than Madagascar, but you can still see the outlines from it near the shorelines. There's been human interference here, but man, this area was definitely not spared one bit. Chevrons stretch very, very far inland and en masse across the entirety of the South African coastline, stretching from the east to the furthest point down south. Now, this part of Africa is quite flat, so the mega tsunami just pushed its way inland with ease, decimating everything in its way in a matter of seconds. They just keep going and going and going, with their direction on point in regards to the location of the epicenter and a characteristic V-shape witnessed in every formation. This ain't no Aeolian process, guys. This is a mass of chevrons deposited by a major asteroid impact. Truly terrifying stuff to witness. And, well, what better way to end this epic journey than to finish right here, at the southernmost point of Africa, where the damage finally ends. This very long gash is one of probably hundreds of points of evidence that I've provided for the Burkle Crater impact event. In this massive documentary series, we have journeyed from the southern tip of Tasmania through to Victoria, South Australia, and then Western Australia, looking at every single point along the coastline. We then took a look at Antarctica, 
and in this episode, I provided you with a great deal of evidence to support the fact that the Burkle Crater impact event was one that certainly happened, and evidence is everywhere. I hope you guys enjoyed this series. It's been a very long, intriguing, and epic journey. Just a heads up, I'll be combining all episodes into one long documentary. So these are the chevrons deposited all around the globe from the catastrophic Burkle Crater meteorite impact. A truly terrifying, nightmarish situation that I honestly couldn't even fathom. But this event did happen, and events like it, and worse than it, will be repeated in the future. And the only way we can defend ourselves is by arming ourselves with knowledge. Thanks for watching.